Hi everyone, I am delighted to be sitting here right now in Hamburg with Nick Law and he is the Accenture Song Global Lead for Design and Creative Tech. And I am about to ask him a range of questions. He's pretty new to Accenture Song. He joined just six months ago. I want to ask him what drew him to Accenture Song and I want to get a sense of how he arrived at this moment. And then I want to talk to him about the creative industry, the advertising industry, this thing we call the internet and where it's heading next. And we are in great hands when it comes to answering those questions. So I am excited about what is ahead. Nick. Hi. Hi there. Thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us. Thank How you. are you on this fine morning? I'm well, thank you. Enjoying Hamburg. Great. Great city. It is indeed a great city. First time? Yes. Ah, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. You get to stay long? I think I'm going to move here. <laughs> Why not? It's fantastic. Why not? I'm you can I'm bring the whole team here. Yeah. Um, okay, Nick, thank you so much for sparing the time to talk to us today. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Let's start by talking a bit about you because you are a fascinating person. As I said, six months into an incredible new post at Accenture Song, you've talked before about how your career evolved from yeah. design to advertising to this thing we call the internet that we've been obsessed with for the last 20 years or more. Can you give us a sense of just how it is you arrived at this, this place in your career? What's the evolution you've been through to get here? Well, there's two things that sort of characterize my career. One is that I straddled the sort of pre-internet and, and then the internet world. So what that afforded me, not by any design, by the way, it's not like I had a grand plan. I, I left Australia very early and went to London and worked in design. And this was, again, before the internet. And, and so my craft, early craft, was, was design. Um, and then I and then I chose to uh, try try advertising, right? Which you know, of course, all my designer friends were horrified by. Uh, but I found that very interesting. Very different culture at the time. These things were not connected. You know, design had a very specific way of looking at the world, a different vernacular, a different way of describing what an idea is. And then I found myself in this other world, advertising, which was different again. And then by the time I got to the to the states in the mid '90s, the internet was becoming a thing. And it became clear to me that all of these things were going to, or all of the sort of creative craft that I had learned up until then around design and storytelling, were going to get collapse into this new medium. Even in the early stages when it was really just a hyperlinked brochure, it became obvious that the pipe was going to keep getting bigger. The ex you know the experience of of the interfaces richer, and that it would become a great canvas. So I you know by the time I got to RGA which was in the early 2000s, um, I had this sort of breadth of, of creative experiences. I'd sort of lived with different creative tribes. And I was, I was at a place where I could see all of those things become connected. And so what, what was interesting to me about, about the internet, and it certainly has played out, um, it, is that all of those skills were not just going to be useful in this new medium, but they were going to be connected in a way which was going to sort of drive innovation and, and, and creativity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When you arrived at RGA in the early 2000s, were they excited about the internet? I mean, you arrived feeling this buzz, it sounds mm -hmm. like, and, and this understanding, which as you say, proved to be entirely right, that so much of what you'd done before was about to collapse into this new medium. Was that embrace? Was that point of view embraced at RGA in the early two thousands? Was it resisted? No, no. It was it was a very deliberate choice on the part of Bob Greenberg. So RGA up until then had been a uh, a sort of technology and production company. Famously, did a whole bunch of title designs: Alien, Ghostbusters, Superman, and and got into the into the commercial production business and did, so worked in special effects in in movies, but also in in, 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 the, in the commercial industry. And I think Bob, Bob Greenberg, who's the, he and his brother Richard Greenberg were the founders of the company, and Bob, when I arrived, was the CEO. Um, I think he, he made that shift, a very deliberate shift to go into this new thing called the internet, partly because what he had invented, or what RJ had invented up until then, was sort of becoming commoditized. Stuff that they had created was now off the shelf, 
and uh, and and Bob is an internally curious person, um, and this internet seemed like a thing, so it was a very deliberate choice. And and it and and what was it? What what's interesting about about the fact that RJ was a production company was that their relationship to the internet was very practical. So production companies are really about mastering a particular medium. Um, and the interesting thing about the internet was that the medium changed constantly. Every six months, there was a new language to worry about, a new programming language, a new uh, you know, a utility. And it grew and the pipe got bigger. And so I think it helped that RGA was from a production background because they had a very pragmatic view. Like when Flash became the language of the internet, oh, we need to get animators. We need to get, you know, it was a very simple, you know, we were honest about our relationship with our medium. And we built the agency stack from the bottom up, from production to sort of, okay, now let's add strategy and become, become an agency. We had add, add good copywriting, add good storytelling. The pipe got big enough to tell great stories. Okay, now this, this internet is changing businesses. Let's add business transformation. Oh, by the way, this, there's all of these, this is a whole ecosystem of startups as a result of this. Oh, why don't we get into ventures? You know, and so, but I actually, I actually think that building capabilities from the bottom up helps because you have this sort of, you have this very practical language of the medium, which we're going to talk about, I'm sure. But, but I think that's, that, that, that was, you know, so it was a deliberate choice, but not only was it a deliberate choice, but it was actually a choice that played out mostly because RGA had been a production company. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we've been, you know, it's just so fascinating to get a picture of the creative industries and their collision with the internet back then. And of course, some of us are old enough to, <laughs> to have lived through that, to remember that. Yeah. Um, and like you say, we've been on this incredible journey since then from the hyperlinked brochure, you know, of 1995 that we got so excited about to where we are today to, and we may well touch on this, you know, all the hype around the metaverse, the emergence of a new kind of internet as some people see it. Um, you know, we have this sense that the internet now is, of course, it's our lives, it's, it's, it's the day, it's, it's yeah. everything. At the same time, it's still really in the grand scheme of human endeavor, incredibly new. Mm. And this taps into, you know, fascinating things I've heard you talking about before, about the way the, 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 the creative industries, the advertising industry, still in something of an identity crisis or a crisis of processes and thinking yeah. and identity right now. Do you think that's to do with this collision with the internet and with, and with the medium that is the internet? Yes. Like, how yeah, do you think is. that's playing out? What's, what, what's the problem? Well, it, but, it's that in, but it's also a perfect storm because in the late 80s, the advertising agencies, who and up until then had earned their money from media commissions, someone had the, the idea uh, to separate media from creative. And in the process of doing that, get some sort of scales of economy. And it's proven to be the sort of engine of the holding companies' profits, really, is, is, is media, right? Um, and so in that way, it was the right decision. But it was ruinous, I think, for the creatives because, because uh, as, I, as, as I've always believed, cre creativity is about your relationship with a medium, right? Um, I, I'm, I've never really bought this concept of a big idea. I understand that once you had been separated from media, you had to sell something. And this, it sounds very grand to, to, to sell a big idea, but I think you sell creative ideas. And the difference is that, you know, a creative idea is by definition something that has to live in a medium. And actually, in my experience, creative people aren't very good at coming up with ideas without pre-visualizing what those ideas would look like in a medium. So the problem is that, you know, the, 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 that the agencies started to sell ideas based on the last medium that they were fluent in, which was broadcast. And so even to this day, if you sit in a, in a presentation from, a, from a, an advertising agency, they tend to start off the creative portion of the deck with an anthem, a written narrative anthem, which you could pre-visualize as some sweeping metaphorical ad, right? That's a particular format that takes advantage of a particular technology, which is broadcast. But again, it's a perfect storm because at the very same time that they're being separated from the media and we're had this sort of strange idea that their ideas were primal when they were in fact mapping against a very specific medium at the very same time or soon afterwards, 
is when this great fragmentation happened and when everything got connected and when the changing media habits and, and media potentials just exponentially changed. And so, so there, there couldn't have been a worse thing to happen at that time than to sort of separate yourself from the media and then for that media to completely change and fragment. You know, it would have been fine if the media had stayed static and, and the language that they had learnt um, didn't change. But the, but the internet changed everything um, to such an extent. And it, and it affected everything, by the way. It didn't it just affect the way that they thought creatively about what they were making, but also affected how they were organized. Because most agencies to this day, if you go to the creative department, at the top look like a burnback model, right? With, with, with Artred the copywriter as the atomic unit, creative unit. In fact, they call that a creative team. And all the new capabilities that sort of came along, like experience design and systematic visual design and, mm. and, and CG and, you know, and social and mobile, all those things were sort of nested underneath this, this um, immovable structure, which was invented in the late 50s, right? About to, and so all ideas were sort of filtered through this narrative structure, which meant that a lot of the work that these agencies did um, is, is, is basically um, a TV spot extruded into pixels. You know, and so you take a medium that is at best a very limited context because there's no interface in front of broadcast and you put it in a medium, in a suite of mediums that are defined by in a, an interface, that are defined by how you interact with them, which are so by definition more dimensional and more nuanced. So you take a very simple idea of, what an, of, 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 of how a creative idea lives and you put it in a medium that is completely ill-fitted Ill and so to me, that, that, that's a sort of the, the sort of chain of events that led to creative agencies be, being a little bit lost. Now, there's still great work being done by creative agencies, and there are some creative agencies that have mastered parts of that complicated middle of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as a whole, I would argue that the, the industry is shape, the is shape of the industry, the culture of the industry, the sort of creative framing of the industry doesn't fit very well into the modern media. Yeah. I mean, I'm absolutely fascinated by this, you know, this broader sense that people like me and, and you, we were born into this incredibly particular age of, I guess, one to many messaging of broadcast, exactly as you yeah. say, incredibly powerful one to many, one, one to everyone messaging that established these huge like master narratives over society. And we grew up with that and we felt that that was that was the world, that was normal. But I guess across the broad sweep of history, that is incredibly unusual. And we'll just, we'll look back at that moment of, of broadcast that like started with the printing press and yeah. maybe ended with, you know, TV and then the birth of the internet is what kind of ended it as just a unique moment in history where you could, where you could essentially push a message out to an entire population of hundreds of millions and yeah. have them all sing that song. Yeah, um, it right. feels like we're still catching up to the, I mean, our politics is still catching up to the implications oh, of that. Right. Society is, and it sounds like from you, what I'm hearing is that the, the advertising industry is still catching up, the creative industry is yeah. still yeah. catching up. Well, I mean, I, uh, part, part of it is that, is that when an innovation happens, and it doesn't matter when it happens, that there's, a, there's a sort of teething period where that, the potential of that innovation um, is not ex is not completely exploited because creative people haven't been introduced to it. So if you were, I use this example a lot. <clears throat> if you were a photographer at the emergence of photography, you were really a chemist because you had to figure out how to fix an image onto a glass plate. And it took some time before that technology became less cumbersome and more user friendly. Before artists came in and, and created this thing called photography with composition and it had a very different language to painting, which is the thing that came before. And, and but typically when the, when the technicians are, are creating these amazing technologies, <clears throat> as a shorthand, they use the old grammar. So early film was basically a fixed camera filming a play. There was no editing language. They hadn't figured that out yet. The artists hadn't come in and manipulated the technology to its fullest potential. But the technicians had created something. There's this is a fascinating article that you, from the Times at, you know, during the, um, uh, the Menlo Park days of, of Bell when there was this sort of leak. It sort of reminded me of a, of a leak from Apple or something where uh, that this new technology was being invented in Menlo Park called the gramophone. 
And you know, the leak suggested that the applications of that gramophone were going to be multifarious and it was going to be really interesting and things like recording people's last words before they died, you know, distributing sermons. There's a whole list of the applications for this thing for the gramophone. They didn't really mention music, right? <laughs> and I think that we are, we'll yeah. get to talking about this, but I think that we're at that period of the, of the metaverse where, where we're imagining what the potential of spatial computing and blockchain and all of these things might be based on our previous experience and previous grammar. And the truth is we're not really going to understand what these, what, what these new technologies are until creative people, people with an imagination to the, that can sort of look beyond the things that they've done in the past, the grammars that they've learned, the techniques that have worked in old medium and, and invent a new medium. So, you know, that's why the second part of my title is creative tech, because I have a strong belief that especially when things are moving so quickly, imagination needs to be added to these technologies to have a more human understanding of, of its potential, as opposed to this sort of mechanical sort of, you know, we've, we've got this thing and now let's <clears throat> do what we've done before, but with this new technology, and it tends not to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this leads me on to you know, as I said at the as I said at the beginning, six months into this amazing new position at Accenture Song, I want to ask you a bit about what drew you to join, what convinced you, and and you've you've touched on it here. You know, the the kind of team you want to build or the kind of team you want to develop, and also what clients are asking from you. So let's start. That's three. Let's start with the first one. What what drew you? What excited you about yeah. you know in the context of this crisis of this difficulty the industry is going through? What drew you to Accenture Song and, and what can it do differently? Uh, well, part of it was that when I, I was at Publicis for a while and, and I talked a lot when I was at Publicis about my belief in have creative leaders, that there are a lot of agencies out there and the holding companies that, that have creative names on the door, but they're now being run by very competent and very talented operations and, and financial people, right? The holding company's construct seems to favor that, right? Um, and, and my thing was that, you know, the, the, there was two creative agencies that were at the time, this was, you know, around, it was, I think it was before or just after Droga 5 was, was acquired. But the independent agencies um, were the two strongest creative agencies, uh, Wyden Kennedy and Droga 5, and they, were, and they were led by creatives. And I didn't think that was a coincidence. You know, Steve Jobs would say that it was the product people that were running that company. Not exclusively, they, obviously they had great great operations and, and there was a balance between between the artists and the soldiers but but they had a vision from the top which mapped to the product that they and and I think the industry had lost a little bit of that so my I had this sort of platform as I think and part of it was the responsibility of creatives to be not so infantilized by you know chasing awards or or you know or or pretending to be you know like crazy creative people and just you know you can be creative and smart about business and so I just thought it was sort of very interesting that the one company that you think would be the least uh, likely to put a creative in charge put David Droger as the CEO of, of a large part of its company. So that was a signal to me that I really thought was brave, but I also thought it was the right thing to do for a creative company. I've known David for a while, not, not professionally, but you know, just personally, so I had not never worked with him before. We had talked in the past about working together at different times, and it just seemed like a great time um, to to try something new. Um, part part of I think you have this sort of dynamic as a creative person between being a deep practitioner and then and then exploring, and then be, it's like the the Narcissus and Goldmund world, right? You're either in the monastery working hard, and you know, or you get out and look at the world and see what's, and you got to go between these two worlds. And to me, uh, the, Accenture is such a big, broad, interesting company that I knew that uh, working there, I'd be learning as much as I was contributing. So, and I like the idea of, of uh, helping David build something. Yeah, and of course, David is now CEO of... CEO of Accenture. Song. Yes, exactly. And, and, and it sounds as though the kind of team you want to develop is exactly, as you say, a team of, of creatives, of artists, of dreamers, who can think creatively about how we use yes. these new media, these new mediums that the that the internet, that a connected world is providing? Is that a fair summary? That is, yes. Like, I mean, I get you know there'll be young people watching this. What what kind of person excites you? Um, 
who do you want to get your hands on and what can they do to turn themselves into that kind of person yeah. thinking about people who want to join the industry mm -hmm. you're as in. a creative i think you need to be curious enough to keep trying new mediums but also committed enough to actually develop a craft across those mediums now there's a, there's an inherent tension there because if you believe in the sort of gladwellian maxim that it takes 10,000 hours to become good at something but you're still having to to keep up with new mediums and then you've got to figure that 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 balance out you don't want to become you don't want to slide across the top of a bunch of mediums and never never master any you know unless you want to be a manager or or, or you know or a producer or something in which case your literacy across mediums is really useful but as a practitioner and this is something that apple does really well it's something we did really well at rga is that you want deep deep um expertise and, and mastery over these mediums in the end, execution is, 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 the, is the, the sort of last mile of creativity. Mm. And if you can't do that, then nothing that happens before that matters. So, so I, I think it's really important to value craft, to work hard at a craft, but always to keep, keep your head up, keep looking, see how that craft can evolve depending on the context of new technologies. So curious and committed, I would say, is the two things I'm looking for. And what do you think are, I mean, what are some of the mediums that you're most excited about? Some of the, the channels, dare I say it, kind of trends that are reshaping the internet right now. I mean, we mentioned the metaverse and there's yeah. been, of course, a ton of hype about that for the last, you know, 12, 24 months. What, what's your thinking on that? Is that one of the mediums you're excited yeah, about? Yeah, it is. But I mean, the thing that there are different parts. I, I'm excited by AR because I see a medium that where where you can map creativity in all of these different contexts because you're in the real world in AR and you're mapping to a context. And it just seems to me that the, 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 the possibilities there are endless, you know, whether it's enterprise or consumer or there's always this need to augment your reality. Mm right, in different ways. So that's, I think that it, when it comes to spatial computing or something, the more immersive experience of VR, I think that the, what's interesting there is that it is this, this collapsing of the, the two worlds that I was trying to stitch together at RGA, which is storytelling and great design. Um, in another way, it's like temporal thinking and spatial thinking. And, and just by definition, designing in, in in VR is both of those things. Like you, if you want to send people through an experience, which is temporal, it's a version of storytelling. But, 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 this, but choosing um, what space to experience that in is infinite. So, you, so you've got to have both a, a, a sensibility of, 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 sort of temporality and storytelling, but also the sort of infinite possibilities of that within a space. So from a design and storytelling point of view, you need both so deeply that 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 it's it's the sort of it's the end state of of this stories and systems construct that I've been thinking about since the beginning of the internet. Yeah. Um, the, and the other the other technology which I think is fascinating right now is this 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 sort of AI human interaction and has you know most recently been expressed in this Wally sort of craze, which is which is astonishingly um, uh, creative. And I think, Will, in time, you will recognize people that master that ability to turn different prompts into image and, and, and moving and spaces and worlds. Um, it won't be right now where it's just incredible for us to see that you could create something. It's like, oh my God, I can fix this image on a plate. And next, the next thing will be people mastering and, and figuring out the nuances of how to manipulate that in such a way and, and, and the thing is that there's something about creativity which has been expanded by, by the more recent technologies because the more recent technologies take an idea and make it realized quicker and quicker. There was a time when an idea took a long time to sort of get out and become sort of mechanically produced within a medium. And now we've got to a point with this AI human interaction where an idea becomes something out in the real world almost instantaneously. You know, as long as it takes to type a few sentences. So that means that you can try a lot more options, but it also means that you can create a lot more things. And so uh, this, we're probably going to be in a world where there are, there's more content than people to consume it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and the advances we've seen with, you know, the natural language models and the AI image generators just across the last 12, 18 months. Have I know, just been it's been, yeah, it's, and it's exponential because, it's because machine learning 
teaches itself. So right. it's not constrained by by our uh, you know, sort of human innovation. It's it's it it just keeps feeding back on itself. And so it's the exponential change in these technologies. I think we're going to be shocked what we yes. can do in a year. Yes, yes, and and yeah. like you say, I mean, I, it's you know, I I I have some sort of more traditional visual arts friends who are dismayed by the emergence of these AI image generation tools. And, and I, I get that, but I, I, I also say to them, you know, do, do, don't you think people said the same when, for example, photography emerged? Oh, this is diminishing human craft. This is the Look, end of I remember art. when it's, I it's, first it moved, doesn't have to. when I first moved to London, there was a sort of moral panic around the demise of typesetters. Right. Yes. I can't, you can't set type on a Mac. That's <laughs> absurd. And of course, the first versions of typesetting on a Mac were pretty crude, just as these first versions of image manipulation using text are pretty crude. But we, you know that we're going to get to a place of mastery, of course. Yeah, yeah. And I was looking at a website the other day um, where already people who've, who've cultivated the craft of, these, uh, of developing these AI prompts to generate images, they're selling their prompts. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's a marketplace That's for AI image yeah. generation prompts. That's like selling music samples. So and, this is yeah. how, you know, I think we're at the, yeah, exactly. We're at the beginnings of a new kind of conceptual art that's absolutely fascinating. Now, I mean, rewinding a bit to thinking about these young people that you want to get your hands on. You know, I talk to clients, when I talk to people about technology, fundamentally what I, what I say to them, it, if you summarize it in a sentence or two, is, you know, technologies. Emerging technologies are great, they're very exciting, we're all excited about them, but if you want to do something meaningful with them, see them through the lens of fundamental human needs, like convenience and value and status, you know, the collision between technology and age-old human nature is where innovation can happen that's meaningful. It feels that you're saying, or part of what you're saying, is that these new mediums are very exciting, they're powerful, but we can bring, or creatives should bring, young creatives should bring, um, age-old eternal aspects of the craft, like storytelling, like the principles of design, and reinvent them for these new mediums. Is that? Yeah, I think so. And use your imagination, because I think we're... I heard a quote, I can't remember who I heard this from, but the, someone was asked whether they were worried about the... about. Uh, AI becoming, you know, having having this sort of general intelligence and yeah. taking over the world, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the answer that this person gave was, I'm more worried about humans becoming more like machines. And I think that we definitely are in this world, at the, you know, where a large part of our, our world believes that everything can be answered through the sort of the brute force of an algorithm. Um, and, and a lot Obviously, this, it's, we can do amazing things, but you should never discount imagination. Trend lines do not, are not consistent. You know, you, we're very bad at predicting because we predict based on the past and, the, and there's no version of the future that looks like the past, right? I mean, and you look at the elections and things that have happened late, lately where, where whole models have been proven wrong. Now, it doesn't mean that these models aren't useful, but it does mean that, that, that um, that imagination is something that that is is in, in some ways more powerful. You can take these leaps, these intuitive leaps, based on your understanding of the world, which can be informed by data. But don't think that data is going to lead you exactly methodically towards what's right. And so that's why you need creative people involved in all of this, so that we don't extrude the most artless crap that chases you around the web. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, and there's a lot of that. Let's be yes. honest. There is there is some of that out there. Some. Let's. Uh, yeah, that's generous. Um, I wanted to ask you about clients, but imagination is such a great place to end. Are the clients? What are the clients asking you for now at Accenture Song? How has it changed? Now, are they open to that vision of the centrality of imagination and you know, dare I say it, creative risk? Are they more open to that? Are they less open because the times look tough? How are you finding I think, well, that? Well, I'm having conversations with that open to that because that's what song represents within the Accenture world. Um, um, growth through imagination and, and you know, application of great technology, but also with this sort of creative bent. Um, I think you know, the clients that I speak to, I think are, are grappling with the same problems as the agencies actually. Right? What is creativity? What, what is, what's gonna reach people? How do we reach people in a way um, where we get 
where we, where we reach as many people, but but uh, enha- enhance that interaction in a way that doesn't annoy them. You know, I mean, from from marketers at least, it's um, you know we live in this world where it's very difficult to be heard, and when you are heard, it's often it's in the most annoying way. So it's a really difficult puzzle, and it and you know it just relates to the presentation I'm about to give, which is that we live in a world of sort of accretion of complexity. You know, the promise of the internet, which was that we're going to give you control over things and we're going to get rid of a lot of middlemen and, and women. And, 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 and it is so, in some ways it's played out. In other ways, it's actually created this sort of self-service culture where it's very difficult to get anything done because it's just too much to get done. Too many interfaces to interact with. Too many, you know. And so, and so I, for me at least, I mean, when I speak to clients, I talk about this deep simplicity, right? Like... If you want to be human in this world, the best way to be human is to be simple. Because if you're not simple, you're going to be impenetrable. And, uh, and you know, the, 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 uh, the problem with being an expert is you become blind to simplicity because you're an expert in so many th- things relating to what you do that you think the customer cares about all the things you care about and the customer doesn't give a fuck about most of those things. <laughs> yes. Right? They yes. care about one or two things and so you need to get to the, pro- you need to have a process where you take the complexity of your organization, your product and media in general and technology in general and make some hard decisions, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I can't hear, I can't wait to hear you talk later on about simplicity. I think that's such a, a, a powerful theme. And if you and Accenture Song can help us imagine our way to, a, to simplicity and to a simple, in the best sense of the word, internet, you would have done the world <laughs> an amazing service. Nick, thank you so much for joining us in this conversation today. It was absolutely fascinating. So thank you. No, thank you. Mm-hmm.